Inflation has been on people's mind over the last two years, and many struggle to get by. Here on the podcast, we've spoken about its causes, its consequences, and its evolution. But there's something else that we haven't touched upon yet. Inflation expectations. So how people think inflation will move in the future. This is a crucial factor to consider while fighting inflation. You might have heard the media talk about inflation expectations going up or down, but if you don't know what they are or why they matter, you are in the right place. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Stefania Sekola. With me today are Jeff Kenny and Dimitris Georgarakos, They are researchers here at the ECB. Measuring how people think inflation will evolve is difficult, but has come a long way in recent years. One example of this progress is the Consumer Expectations Survey, which Jeff and Dimitris launched here at the ECB in 2020. The survey looks at what people in the euro area think and what they expect when it comes to the economy, of course, including inflation. Jeff Dimitris, welcome to the ECB podcast. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Stefania. Our job is to keep price stable. We do this by making sure that inflation remains low, stable and predictable. The level of inflation today can influence how people expect prices to develop in the future. And these expectations are important. People use them to make decisions about their spending, borrowing and investing. And businesses also keep them in mind when setting prices for goods and services. Jeff, can you tell us more about what inflation expectations are for the people who don't know and why they matter for central banks? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stefania. So inflation expectations, I think, as you said, they refer to the level of inflation that people expect to occur in the future. So we can think about trying to measure the expected level of inflation over different time horizons. Uh, For example, what people expect inflation to be one year from now or what they expect it to be even three or, or five years from now. So why do these expectations matter for central banks at all? Well, let's take the example of the expectations for inflation three to five years ahead. These provide an indication of how consistent people's thoughts and beliefs about the future are with our price stability objective, which, as you know, is to achieve 2% inflation over the, over the medium term. If expectations drift increasingly too far away from this target, it could be a worrying sign that people's actions will start to diverge from the actions that they would take under the assumption that price stability will be assured. And this could be something related, for example, uh, in terms of consumption, right? They could stop consuming or consuming more. Exactly, yes. So their beliefs could affect their behavior in in the economy. Yeah. Um, So, for example, you know, it could influence how firms set prices. It can also affect the outcome of wage negotiations. So, you know, to summarize, sometimes expectations can result in a kind of self-fulfilling dynamic that central banks may need to protect against by adjusting interest rates and monetary policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about how people form their inflation expectations. Dimitris, what kind of things shape how people, how someone expects price to develop? Thank you, Stefania. Um, one thing to to keep in mind is that there is a major difference of uh, consumers' inflation expectations uh, with uh, experts or forecasts of professional forecasters. The consumers' inflation uh, expectations, I would say, tend to be quite personal in the sense that they depend on people's own experiences um, and activities. One example of this is the role of shopping experience and frequently purchased goods like foods and uh, energy prices. And basically, we find that such items have a proportionally large influence on the formation of consumers' inflation expectations 
compare with other goods um, mm -hmm. and services. So uh, how much I spend with food uh, is going to influence my inflation expectations more than, for example, uh, items that I don't buy so often. For absolutely. The, mm -hmm. the fact that you uh, frequently purchase food uh, uh, has a, a greater influence. Yeah. Now, uh, some research has suggested that the role of personal shopping experiences can help us understand why, for example, women uh, tend to have higher inflation expectations uh, than men. For example, when we look at households where women and men uh, share the shopping responsibilities more equally, I would say, uh, we observe almost no difference in uh, their expectations about inflation. Ah. Another example is the role of memories uh, and lifetime experience. For example, if someone experienced a period of hyperinflation mm -hmm. in the past, this means a period uh, of really high prices, such uh, a life experience uh, may also impact someone's inflation expectation. How sensitive then uh, this person tends to be to news about Okay, uh, So if inflation. I grow up in a country with very high inflation, this uh, uh, tends to stay with me, this experience tends to stay with me and influences how I perceive inflation also later on in life, for example. Exactly. And, and not only that, uh, this, uh, we have some research evidence that suggests that car could be transmitted through generations, ah. actually. So, for example, if my grandmother experienced hyperinflation, this may influence how I think about inflation too. Okay. So, we need to be careful because we are going to transmit this to our children, basically, right? Yes. Ah, interesting. So, and these are all kind of very personal experiences, of course. And Jeff, are there other things that can shape our inflation expectations? Yes, indeed. So there's this personal dimension, but there's also the dimension of the wider economy and uh, the, the general economic situation and how that can also influence people's expectations. So we've learned that inflation expectations do reflect uh, the broader economic concerns going on in the real economy, and in particular, negative news uh, that gives rise to, for example, negative economic sentiment. A good recent example of this uh, was in 2022, uh, where in March, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the ECB's Consumer Expectation Survey, which you mentioned in the, in the beginning, Stefania, recorded an immediate and a stark increase in inflation expectations as a result of, uh, of the invasion in Ukraine. So another broader concern that we clearly observe uh, when we think about how expectations are formed is that people uh, tend to extrapolate very recent changes in prices when forming their expectations so about what, the future. So what they do exactly? So, so um, for example, if they observe a change today, they tend to think this change is going to persist very far into the future, maybe even over the next year, but also even over further horizons into the future, three and even, even five years ahead. Um, so, um, you know, in this sense, uh, there, there's evidence that consumers may overreact to certain price changes. And of course, this has also important implications uh, for central banks and monetary policy. Um, so, for example, in a situation where consumers may be overreacting to a price uh, shock, uh, it may be important for central banks to step up their communication in order to help set the record straight and explain what is actually going on in the economy. On the other hand, you know, the mere fact that it may be an overreaction uh, means that we, we can't, it's not that we can ignore the risks that may be associated with an overreaction in expectations because it's precisely that overreaction that can give rise to this type of self-fulfilling dynamic uh, that we were discussing yeah. earlier on. Yeah, interesting. So basically, what I have in terms of information influences what I'm going to think is going to be the future. And if I interpret this information in an overreactive manner, this could be a problem also in terms of what this produces and then for the central bank to take into account. Interesting, interesting. But how do these sometimes very personal perceptions actually change the prices that we pay? Uh, could you, uh, Dimitris, give us an example, a very concrete one? Sure. Um, well, you may think of a person that stops, say, paying for a coffee uh, because its price has increased. Then, if more and more persons are doing so, uh, basically they will start buying less. This will make demand go down. And this 
uh, ultimately helps prices to moderate. Uh, but there is also another aspect of this. Uh, basically, if many people stop buying uh, a particular type of good, they are also indicating to the company that produces it that uh, they won't tolerate this increase in prices. Uh, which, in theory, should push then the company to either lower them down uh, prices or, or not increase them further, if you like. Another example and uh, something that uh, I think is really important to central banks is that uh, if people think that inflation will stay high for longer, workers will likely ask for higher wages. Yes. And if people search for higher wages in other jobs, then the companies will have pressures to increase prices because they need to pay these people. Mm -hmm. So in such a scenario, elevated inflation expectations can contribute to what we often call uh, a wage price uh, spiral. Yes. Obviously, uh, as central bank, we don't want this to happen. So that's why it, it's so important that we monitor closely uh, consumers' inflation expectations. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's like a dance. You need to know what the, the consumers uh, will expect and what is, could be their next move and so that they get to know also a bit what the central banks will do as a next move. So it is really this kind of flow of information. Uh, at this stage, I want to dig deeper into the measuring part that you have mentioned. Um, I said it earlier, now inflation expectations can be very personal. And what we said, um, one of you said a minute ago, even in the same family, I think it was you, Dimitris, who said, now even in the same family, inflation expectations could be very different. Jeff, how exactly do you measure uh, the inflation expectations in the consumer expectation survey? Yeah, so we have measures of inflation expectations um, uh, that are consistently measured across consumers in 11 euro area countries. And, and this covers about 94% of the euro area population. So very representative of the overall population in the euro area. Good. And we can analyze these expectations uh, for younger and older consumers, mm -hmm. um, for men and women. Um, and we can examine also their evolution uh, over time, every month, um, also in relation to other economic uh, developments and other economic decisions that consumers are taking as well. We ask people if they have, first of all, noticed any changes in the prices for goods and services over the past 12 months. So these are measures of their perceptions about present inflation. Yeah. And then we ask them to think about the future. Um, and we asked them how much they think the prices of goods and services will go up over the next 12 months or over the next three years. And this personal future, uh, this personal belief about future inflation is what we know as inflation expectations. Beyond these measures of expectations uh, themselves, we also uh, try and elicit uh, people's individual uncertainty about f future inflation. Mm -hmm. So this gives us a sense about how confident consumers are in their beliefs about the future. And this is also really helpful in our analysis in, in trying to uh, track the implications of these changes in expectations. So for if the I'm economy. very unconfident about what I think, I might change my mind uh, if you ask me next time, for example. So mm -hmm. this is something that gives you a good basis to rely on the data uh, with certain percentages or something like that this, I guess. Yes, I think, Stefania, that's a very good example as well. Yeah. So today, Dimitris, we released our latest results. Uh, what have you seen? Wh what did you observe? Exactly, Stefania. According to our latest results from the Consumer Expectation Survey, the median expectation for inflation over the next um, 12 months uh, was 3% in March 2024 slightly down from 3.1% in February. But this should be compared with uh, a peak uh, uh, in expected uh, inflation expectations uh, towards the end of 2022 that was close to 6%. Okay, but this means people now expect inflation to go down, basically. Basically, they gradually uh, adjust their inflation expectations uh, downward. Then, uh, as uh, Jeff already alluded to, uh, it is important to remind that uh, these measures of expected inflation are not strictly comparable uh, with official inflation statistics. 
Uh, this is because we basically ask people about how they expect prices in general mm-hmm. to evolve over the future. And we do this because many consumers don't follow, as we discuss closely, official inflation indicators, but instead they have a sense about how prices will evolve in the future based on their own personal experience. Exactly, we mentioned, no? Yeah. As a result, their individual responses can reflect their personal consumption activities, which can be quite different across different demographic uh, groups. In general, though, uh, we find that uh, once we average across many consumers, the patterns over time we observe are broadly consistent, I would say, uh, with how official inflation statistics evolve over time. Mm -hmm. And do we have some examples for our listeners? Like, for example, what do you observe in terms of social demographic, like younger people expectations uh, recently in the latest one? We still observe this gender gap that uh, I I mentioned uh, earlier. (laughs) So uh, So women women expect higher inflation. uh, Relatively higher, uh, especially as they're engaged in more exposure to changes in prices and more uh, shopping. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But w- one thing I think that is worth to emphasize, given what you've asked, uh, Stefania, is that this type of downward movement that you highlighted and Dimitris highlighted is this is fairly common across, you know, All most the of the groups. Oh, okay. In society. So young people. Exactly. More Maybe the pace senior. of decline has been different uh, across some, but the general pattern of decline is observed across widely across across different groups. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thanks. So now the most important question is, if inflation expectations are so important for keeping price stable, and this is our mandate at the ECB, what can we do to help people form them, to form their inflation expectations? So, yeah, I think the first thing we can do and we we have to do is to deliver on our mandate. So ultimately, the research shows that central banks are judged on their track record. Yeah. Um, So if they have a good track record of ensuring price stability, people are much more likely to believe that they will achieve price stability in the future. Okay. But a second thing that we can do, and we've alluded to this already, is to communicate more actively with the public about inflation. All of the evidence seems to suggest the need for this. Okay. Uh, in particular, it shows that consumers will respond in a reasonable way to simple and factual information about inflation. Clarity. Uh, exactly, exactly. And, you know, this is very important in a world where there's a lot of information overload, uh, fake news, that this simple and factual information really has an effect on, on consumers' beliefs about the future. Yeah. And building up consumers' knowledge about monetary policy, you know, has also been shown to establish greater trust in the central bank. Mm -hmm. Trust is crucial for us because we need people to believe that we will continue fighting inflation until it has reached our 2% target. So here at the ECB, we recently conducted research also with Dimitris and other colleagues And in that research, we showed that when we communicate to people are just simply telling them what our target is. Mm -hmm. um, And when we explain uh, how monetary policy plays a stabilizing role in the economy, this can contribute to an increase in the perceived credibility that price stability will be maintained in the in the future. So, you know, this is where our communication has such a crucial role to play. If central bank communications are unclear, people will tend to form their views about future price changes based on their current or past inflation experiences. And this can result in a situation where people's expectations start to drift away in the wrong direction, making the task of maintaining price stability all the more difficult. Yeah. So in this dance, we said before, no, the communication is essential. And maybe, Dimitris, uh, how it is so insen- essential? Well, Stefania, this is uh, not an easy uh, <laughs> to answer question, I would say, uh, because, of course, uh, we have plenty of evidence to, to suggest that uh, communicating with the general public can be quite effective. However, reaching out to people uh, is not always easy. I would say it's more challenging. Uh, First of all, it's very difficult to reach out 
especially to non-expert audiences that uh, don't pay a lot of attention to central bank news. Mm. Uh, we see, for example, in uh, the Consumer Expectations Survey that about 30% of euro area consumers say that they are not much or not at all interested in monetary policy. Mm. Uh, so despite the fact that inflation is something that affects everyone in their daily lives, it's still difficult to reach uh, out to these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, one practical strategy, I would say, is to use, try to use a, a diverse range of different communication channels from traditional media like TV and newspapers to social media and, of course, podcasts. <laughs> Another thing uh, we can do is to ensure uh, that we have diversity in our policy committees. In other words, uh, that we have diversity in the messengers, uh, if you like, not the message per se. Uh, Such diversity is of value on its own right, of course. For example, it can help ensure better policy decisions. However, it may also help with communication and especially in building trust and knowledge across underrepresented groups. So the messenger matters, right? Exactly. Interesting. And and this is why also conversations like these ones, where we try to break down more complex topics into easier, more digestible uh, elements or components are so important. So thank you very much, Jeff and Dimitris. Um, But before we wrap up, we have questions that we ask all our guests on the podcast. And that's for a hot tip linked to the topic we've been discussing today. Have you thought of something inspiring for our listeners? So I don't know if it's hot, okay? <laughs> but um, it's it's a tip, at least, for, for someone uh, interested to learn more about this topic. Um, so we recently published uh, a study. It, it was in the ECB working papers in March. And it has the catchy title, uh, Tell Me Something I Don't Already Know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> learning... Uh, in a high and a low inflation setting. And this kind of study uh, was part of a large scale international collaboration. It involved economists and economic surveys um, from Europe, uh, from uh, the US, uh, South America, and also from as far away as New Zealand. And the study really emphasizes uh, this last point mentioned by Dimitris, namely the, the challenges confronting uh, central banks in their communication with the public. And this is particularly because of consumers, you know, varying attention to monetary policy and inflation. So, um, I mean, there is maybe a hot tip in that paper for central banks in terms of their communication Uh, and how they should go about meeting this communication challenge. And this is embodied in a quote uh, from Benjamin Franklin, Mm -hmm. uh, which we give at the uh, start of the paper. So uh, Franklin wrote uh, about successful communication in his memoirs, and uh, he said the following. Uh, He said, tell me and I forget. Uh, Teach me and I remember involve me and I learn. And I think this last point about involvement is really the hot tip for central bank communication, that it really needs to be about reaching out proactively and engaging with the public. And luckily, this is precisely what many central banks are already starting to do today. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And by the way, dear listeners, um, you're going to find in the show notes the links uh, to the research. Uh, By the way, you seem to be also very good listeners because you like surveys so much. This means you want to listen to what people have to say. Dimitris, any final thoughts on on, for our listeners? I find this a good opportunity to thank very much all these Euro area citizens Yes. who spent time and effort to participate in our survey and share their experiences. Yes. And not only their experiences, also their thoughts, beliefs, expectations, and behavior. Uh, as we try to explain in this podcast, uh, keeping track of their inflation expectations along with other expectations, of course, and decisions they make, it is of paramount importance for our analysis, helps us also to optimize the design of our policies, and deliver on our price stability uh, mandate. And 
I will conclude by saying, looking forward, perhaps listeners to this podcast may be also asked one day to take part in our survey. Yes. Who knows? <laughs> and I hope that they listen today, make, uh, by listening today, they make them see that uh, their views can have indeed a very significant impact. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you. And this brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank really ECB researchers Jeff Kenny and Dimitris Georgarakis for this very interesting conversation. Dear listeners, check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Stefania Secola. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. And in the spirit of Europe, today I'd like to end in Slovak and say Dovitenia. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>